Hey everyone, welcome to the Alumni Career Chat Biotech. My name is Rave Hitt and I'm one of the assistant directors in the Career Center for Engineering and Physical Sciences. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining us at the end of a long day. Um, I know you all just had classes all day, so I appreciate you taking the time to connect with alumni um, and learn about your career path. So I'm gonna stop sharing just so we can see everyone in the room here. And we're just gonna get started um, with some introductions. We'll have our panelists introduce themselves then answer a couple questions um, to get the conversation started. But the majority of this time is for you all students um, to ask the questions that you have about how to prepare for a career in biotech um, or any questions you have about our alumni's backgrounds or their companies. So yeah, whatever's urgent for you, we really want to address that first and foremost. So let's dive in with some introductions and I'll invite Allison to introduce yourself first. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, excited to be here and chat with you all. Welcome any questions. Um, my name is Allison. I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, bachelor's in chemical engineering from Johns Hopkins. Was always super interested in sci scientists and engineering growing up. Uh, and then I did the MEng program in the bioengineering department at UC Berkeley. So that's my tie to UC Berkeley. Uh, and then after that, uh, kind of got rejuvenated and I actually went on to do a PhD at Dartmouth. Uh, I just graduated there. And we recently spun off a startup in the in vitro diagnostic space, which as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, has renewed interest in it given the ongoing pandemic, uh, now endemic possibly. Um, so now I serve as co-founder and CTO of that startup. We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right in the heart of Kendall Square, which has its own super vibrant biotechnology ecosystem. So happy to field any questions related to that. Um, the company is called Nanopath. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, so yeah, excited to be here. Thanks, Allison. Uh, next, I'll pass it over to Shilpika. Hi, guys. I'm very excited to be here and give you all any advice, especially relevant advice. So big thank you um, for letting me join you guys. I go by Pi. So if you have any questions for me, 3.14, Apple Cherry, call me out. Um, so I grew up in Arizona and I came to Cal for my undergrad. It was my first time kind of leaving uh, and it was great. I studied bioengineering and materials, uh, material science engineering. So it was a joint ma major. Then I did an internship at Medtronic in Tempe, Arizona. So kind of back home, it's the real Silicon Valley if anyone asks. And I worked uh, so on some wafer scale processing for medical devices, which is very interesting. Then I had my midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, and uh, I went back to school, got my master's at Columbia. Um, and then I kind of stayed in the same space. So I was technically employed in um, cardiac rhythm management, but I worked in diabetes, um, cardiac structural, structural heart, uh, spinal. I got kind of a lot of different types of experience. And now my role at Boston Scientific is very much uh, mechanical, a little bit less electrical, working in um, new acquisitions. So I work on two products. Um, I'll probably get to talk about them a little bit more later. One is Sentinel, which is a cerebral protection system for minimally invasive uh, surgical procedures in the heart. And then also a really cool device called Millipede that's also uh, minimally invasive mitral annuloplasty, first of its kind. So it's been a pretty cool run. Thanks, Pai. And then Masaki. Hey, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Excited to chat with you all. I'm happy again to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, my background in uh, chemical engineering, uh, class of 2013 uh, at the College of Chemistry. Uh, I grew up in Palm Springs, Southern California. So it was nice to come up to NorCal and escape. And I've been up here ever since. Um, after college, I worked at NASA for a few months right before the government shut down um, and then decided I probably wanted some more consistent funding uh, into my first job. Uh, so I went to go work at a small pharma company called Ammunix and I did some bioprocess fermentation development um, there. 
And then I moved over to Genentech where I was for five years doing more therapeutic bioprocess development. Um, and then about three years ago, I moved over to a small startup called Culture Biosciences. There are about 25 people, or sorry, I was employee number 12. Uh, and we had about 25 bioreactors at the time. Uh, this company grows cells for a variety of companies across industries at using our own miniaturized bioreactors that we've, we've built in house. Um, and so we have since grown quite a bit over the pandemic. We are now up to about 60 employees and we have over 150 bioreactors that we run uh, to do uh, high throughput, small scale fermentation process development. And I've been working here as a process engineer uh, and more recently have switched over to product management. So I help figure out what we're building next, either from the hardware or from our software or from our bioprocess operations group, uh, helping provide specifications as to what the customers want and how we should approach building it. And one last thing, um, when I was at Genentech, I decided to take additional classes and ended up doing a part-time master's uh, in biomedical informatics through Stanford. Awesome, thank you. So at this point, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about what your days look like in your current roles. Um, you all have different roles, so I think it'd be cool to just hear what you do um, on a regular basis. So Pai, would you like to take this one first? Sure, I can kick it off. Um, so I, my title is Senior Process Engineer. That can mean a lot of different things depending on what company you're at. I mean, Asaki, here we are. What's up? Um, so my role, especially because it's a kind of an acquisition, it's very funny seeing how much more like a startup it can be in a big company. It's very, um, there's a lot of firefighting sometimes because you find out that maybe documentation wasn't done the way it could have been done um, prior to being acquired. So we get to do a lot of that. Um, I run a small team that focuses on a specific part of the product. So generally my day is setting directors, making sure, is there anything that they need to make sure that we're <laughs> tackling things in an efficient way. Um, the part of the device that I work on has a couple different sections to it. So there's um, kind of like an operations management. I have a couple of folks uh, that um, are operations staff that will kind of put things together. They're kind of assemblers. So I have to make sure that they have something to do every day so they're not bored. Uh, they're usually making prototypes for us. And then um, there's another portion which is more strategic. You know, are these processes meeting the requirements, especially in this acquisition space? It's like, can you make them? Is it even feasible? So kind of coming up with weird ways to use existing equipment or purchasing new equipment so that we can make prototypes or asking a vendor. And then the last is kind of the future scoping. So for the next iteration of the project, how could we take input? Um, it's kind of a unique instance of this. Usually if you're at a large company, uh, R&D kind of handles it and then process engineering gets pretty specific requirements. But in this, this case, I'm lucky enough that we get to work hand in hand. So I can ask questions like, are you sure they're gonna be able to turn it like that? Or you know, use this device, like is a physician gonna be able to do that um, without getting hurt? And then they can say, oh yeah, interesting point. Um, so there's a lot of future scoping and automation that I do too in my role. Gotcha, thank you. And then Allison, would you like to share next what your day looks like? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll back up just a like, moment to talk about like what the company does. So as I mentioned we're an in vitro diagnostics company. So my PhD focused on kind of miniature lab on a chip, biomems, nanotechnology, hybrid systems. So how do we develop super high throughput, um, rapid diagnostics, kind of all on a single substrate. So that's the technology we're working on. We're focusing on the women's health space. So we're really interested in, you know, why does it take three days for women to get a result on a urinary tract infection? And our kind of governing thesis is that if it affected everyone like it affected women, th that wouldn't still be a problem. So um, we're focused in on rapid diagnostics of UTIs, STIs, HPV, and kind of looking to deploy our diagnostic into outpatient OBGYN setting. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and we're excited about it because we're, we're a deep technology company, right? We, myself, my co-founder spent 10 cumulative years in our PhD kind of developing the underlying technology that's associated with what we're doing at Nanopath. Uh, so we're not like a, you know, an app effectively. So uh, I think Cambridge is unique from a lot of what goes on in the Bay Area. 
no shade, uh, and that it's not tech, it's actually biotech. So there's one square mile that is Kendall Square. Where, so we're in a facility with 60 other biotechnology startups uh, is where we're housed, right in the car of Cambridge. I think that's pretty unique to Cambridge, Massachusetts. So what is my day like? Um, as a founder, I think, as you can imagine, you're just doing everything, which is what I love about it. So um, one day I'll be dealing with intellectual property and writing a new patent. The next day we're thinking about how do we hire someone? How do we put insurance into a place? Uh, how do we develop equity incentive plans to give our employees equity in the business and uh, make sure they're incentivized to want to make the technology succeed? Um, and then there's a huge component of it that just like research, right? Like how do we continue to drive the science forward? How do we continue to like take what we, we did as academicians and researchers and make sure that continues to drive forward and it's not all product oriented, but also um, that we're contributing to the field and making sure that that what we do at Nanopath is disseminated into, into the field. I think a lot of times companies tend to want to keep it close to the chest, which I respect, but for us, it's really important that we're we're kind of making the general public aware of, of the science that we're developing. So it's super multifaceted. It's kind of hard to capture in like a, what do you do statement, but I would say like 10% science, 20% people, 10% uh, intellectual property. What am I at 40% now? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the rest is, but it's, it's super multifaceted to, oh, space. We think about space today. We just rented 800 square feet of additional space. That was the task today um, and furnishing it with furniture. So it's, it's highly dynamic uh, is what I can say and happy to add in color where everyone is interested. Awesome, thanks. It sounds like you're not only wearing multiple hats, but like multiple wigs, multiple, you know, headdresses, whatever, right? All, all the things, yeah, all the things. Thanks, yeah. And then Mazaki, what does your day look like? Yeah, my day-to-day -day is mainly meetings um, and working with our current customers, collecting feedback, asking them in depth about what they like about our product and what could be better. So I can put together um, some sort of roadmap and figure out what we should build next. I also talk to prospective customers and then talk to all of our stakeholders across the company. Like I said, we have our own hardware team. So we build a bunch of um, the hardware in place. And then we also have a software team that's building all of the control software as well as our visualization software, our product facing software and some internal tools teams uh, to help make sure that we can enter and access data during the execution of the experiment. Uh, and then when I'm lucky, I get to jump into the lab and, and talk to the lab folks to also actually do some of the processing with them so I can better understand when we say, oh, we're going to go do this in the lab or somebody's asking for people to do that, what is the reality? Uh, and to make sure that um, our, our project leads and our, our client success groups also understand the realities of what, can, what is scalable uh, for us as an operations group. When, they, when a, one customer from a certain industry asks us to perform um, a certain type of sampling or downstream processing, uh, doing it one sample at a time, probably the way they're used to, running maybe 10 bioreactors total uh, in their labs is fairly simple and they have two or three people to do that. But when we're trying to do it on the floor with 150 bioreactors to maintain and, and monitor, um, it, it doesn't always map out. Uh, so trying to maintain those conversations around what is the reality of what we're asking people to do and then folding that into how do we make the system better for the next generation of either hardware, software, or operation support? Awesome, thanks. Yeah, it seems like something you all have in common is just people management in several different forms. <laughs> cool, so for the next topic, um, I think it'd be nice to talk about what you did here at Berkeley that really helped fuel your success whether it was particular programs or events or activities you engaged in um, to help prepare you for your career. Uh, so Masaki, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um, probably the one thing that I can uh, say that put me on my path to where I am today was participating in research. Um, when I left high school and went to Berkeley, going into chemical engineering, not really knowing what chemical engineering was, except for I was good at I loved chemistry and I was okay at math. So I was like, okay, that's the thing I need to do. Um, in high school, I hated biology and was had vowed never to do it again. However, my faculty advisor was a chemical engineering professor doing biotech research and synthetic biology and talking to her more made it sound more approachable. Uh, so I ended up um, working in her lab for 
for a bit and then participating in the iGEM team. Uh, it's the International Genetically Engineered Machines competition. Uh, and you have a cohort of usually six to 10 students and work on a, a project from, from cradle to grave, essentially. So really trying to develop a, some sort of question of what can we do in the span of six to 12 months and put together a poster and present it and gives you a lot of practice to figure out what is what are biologically relevant questions that you can ask and, and how do you approach it uh, and how do you present it to people as the research is still in progress and in flight. Um, and through that research opportunity landed me um, the opportunity at NASA and I had the, the biotech world is very small. So a lot of the people I work with today are through connections that I've made throughout my career, uh, either through undergrad connections or through managers that I've had. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd say having that hands-on experience and being able to see something that inspired me to really help guide my career to where it is today. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I bet we'll have some questions about that research um, later on. Sure. And then Pai, would you like to take that one next? Sure. Um, I totally agree. Research was really helpful. Research is the reason that I got my first internship. It's one one whole day of, you know, um, one of my research adventures that got me my job. So just to give background, I worked in a transmission electron microscopy lab, um, mostly working on looking at um, organic, like living organisms, but we did some inorganic uh, cryo-electron microscopy. Um, it was really interesting stuff. Uh, and at some point I got really tired of trying to keep my, they're, they're like Chlamydomonas, they're like cute little single cell, two tail organisms. I really tired of them dying. So, <laughs> so um, I asked my PI, is there anything else that's related to this that I could do? so that I could you know, try something a little bit different. Uh, I was pretty solid at doing uh, TEM. Like, it's very close to photography and I'm super passionate about photography. So the microscopy itself is really interesting. But, um, and he said, okay, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while for a cryo EM, you have to have really, really thin membranes that you put your samples on top of. Um, and depending on their you know, charge retention properties and uh, a couple of other features, you get better pictures. I mean, we're talking like single atom resolution, right? That we want. So any sort of interference um, or, you know, uh, inability to conduct um, noise out is bad. And so, yeah, I spent one day in the wafer fab following someone at the nanofab around. And that was enough to get me my first internship and then my first job at probably one of the coolest applications of wafer scale uh, for medical devices. And if you're curious, you can actually see the product that I worked on. I mean, my fingerprints are all over it. You can see like my low stress structures that I designed into a device. It's called Link2 by Medtronic. Um, and that's like two eyes if you're looking it up. But um, I would say, yeah, a big part was research. I have to say I got some really cool 3D print experience uh, from another lab, day lab I worked at while I was um, at UC Berkeley. But Basically, anything that you do because you're genuinely curious uh, will probably get you into a field that you're interested in. I also, just like super quick shout out, um, I was part of the stem cell decal and that taught me how to communicate better because I had to help come up with coursework. I made all the readers um, for the two years that I did it. That was really fun. And then I have to say, I mean, of course, the project classes are really helpful, like console simulation. You're not going to use that for a long time, but when you use it, you need to understand the basics of like how do you even set up a function or what what's possible to model? Because um, especially in industry, you end up outsourcing, but you need to know who to ask and what they're going to be capable of. So it was really helpful. And then um, the last thing was, I'm really glad that I did the BME joint degree with MSc. Uh, BME is a really interesting major, but it can be very, um, you learn a lot, or uh, you learn a little about a lot of different things. So it was really great to learn some extra fundamentals by doing that uh, MSE master or MSE joint program. It's really helpful. Awesome. Thanks for sharing about your research and classes and joint program. And Allison, uh, do you have anything to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, my tenure at Berkeley was very brief. I just did my MN, so I was only there for 10 months. But I will say that 
the structure of that program kind of mimics my life now, right? It's like one third research, one third coursework, one third entrepreneurial training, right? So um, yes, I did go on to do a PhD and that like shaped me as like a deep scientist and researcher, but I think that entrepreneurial bent is what gets me excited about science, it's that translational aspect of it. So I think had I not have seen the ability to do that, right? If I did not know that like any intellectual property I developed during my PhD could actually become a thing, I think I would have kind of lacked that motivation. So I think for me, that's huge. Just like, how do we get, and it's a problem that I like grapple with on a daily basis is like this ivory tower problem is you have all this amazing knowledge sitting, right? Literally sitting. And like, we're actively trying to get it out of Dartmouth now. Like, why is this so hard? So I think that's what motivates me. That's what gets me up, outside of, uh, out of bed in the morning is getting this amazing research that sits in publications out of university. So I think that was great that Berkeley showed me kind of the fundamental building blocks on how to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So at this point, we're going to open the floor. Um, and as you all could see in my opening slide, this event is being recorded. So feel free to ask questions in whichever way you're most comfortable, whether it's sharing your video and microphone or putting the question in the chat. Um, our goal is to just share this with students who couldn't attend. Um, but yeah, whatever works best for you. And then I'll kind of go back and forth between you know, if you have your hand raised that you're ready to ask a question verbally, we'll do that. And then I'll go back to the chat, kind of mix it up just to keep it interesting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, does anyone want to ask a question verbally for starters? Okay, cool. So it looks like uh, Tatum was first with their hand raised. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, sorry, my voice is all messed up. Um, first of all, thank you guys for taking the time to uh, meet with us. Um, it's very cool. Um, but I am a biology major. I'm not an engineering major at all. A bunch of my friends are engineering majors. Um, and while I'm interested in biotech, um, I just wanted to know um, what amount, if any, of your colleagues are biologists by trade. Um, and if anything, like, do the work that they do differ from the work that you do? If that makes sense. I can jump in there. Um, so yeah, I mean, at where I work today within a small startup, there, there's a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, a few of us have chemical engineering degrees, a few of us have mechanical engineering degrees, but there are also people who are working in our operations group, have a biology background, applied biology, um, and there's also plenty of people across the company who have no experience in biotech at all. Most of our mechanical engineers have no idea how cells grow, but are really excited to learn about uh, the application and how that they can develop technologies to enable the industry. And then there's also the business operations side of it all, uh, trying to figure out how do we make this a sustainable business that can scale. Um, and there's a lot of operations management that doesn't even require understanding the biology, but how do we as an organization maintain operations effectively? Um, and I think that there are probably many paths that could have taken me to where I am today as like, to join, if I wanted to join culture biosciences, um, haven't taken a different path. Um, but having some, some of that innate knowledge is probably what drew me towards wanting to do this in the first place. Um, but to answer your question, I, I do think that there are a variety of ways to, to jump into biotech outside of um, engineering strictly, uh, whether that is a, a biology, a applied biology in um, microbiology or therapeutics understanding, um, or from an economic standpoint in business development, you can really jump in wherever you'd like. I can share a quick anecdote. I was on a panel the other day with this chief operating officer of Ginkgo Bioworks. I just went public two days ago, valued at like $17.9 billion. His degree was in history and economics. So um, I think that kind of says it all. If you're interested in it, and he, you know, he just talked all about like the, the idea of being a lifelong learner. So I think you're going to be, I don't know, I don't remember who said it, but you're going to be drawn to what you're interested in. And that, that's what's going to take you. I, I really don't think it matters what's on, what's on the diploma at all. And neither of our co-founders had biology backgrounds. They just thought it was a cool problem and wanted to dive in. 
Yeah, I was going to say something somewhat similar. Um, in my two companies, like Medtronic and Boston Scientific, usually if you have a biology degree, because they're kind of a little bit more structured, which is like both bad and good. Um, they usually, if you have a biology degree, it it leads well into like clinical trials, running clinical trials, and you know you you understand a little bit of the background. Um, but I would say when I was doing my master's, I worked at a biotech incubator and quite a few of the founders in biotech had that really solid background so they could innovate, you know, kind of like in the biotech space in a way that maybe devices, because the two companies I talked about are medical device companies. So it's sometimes a little bit more removed. You do need the engineering background usually um, for engineering role, but startups, you know, just bring what you're passionate about first. It's Tatum. Hi, Tatum. <laughs> um, yeah, bring what you're passionate about first and everything else will come and it doesn't hurt to apply. Yeah, thanks everyone. Definitely echo everything that you, they all said. Um, how about you, Stephanie? What, what question do you have? Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, like, how do you know if you should get a master's degree? Because I was considering getting a master's, but now I'm not so sure. And I'm majoring in molecular and cell biology right now, and I'm not really sure if I need a master's degree in the future. But I, like, I don't really know how to gauge. Great question. I think... You cut out a little bit at the end, um, but yeah, does anyone want to answer that one about how important is it to get a master's? I think it depends on what you want to do, to be honest. Like, um, I, I, so I don't want to throw, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think like um, for me, like as a hiring manager, uh, in general, if you have a bachelor's, you're going to be doing predominantly bench scientists, you're going to be a research associate, you're going to be working for somebody. When you get those graduate degrees, you might be, you know, considered for a higher level position, managing a team, maybe only 50% of your time is spent at the bench and 50% is managing other people. So if you love bench science and you just really want to train for a couple of years as a research associate or lab laboratory technician, I think the bachelor's is super sufficient. Um, if you want to pivot into another field like venture capital or something else, and then maybe you don't need a master's in science at all. I think it's really a function of, of what you want to do. I pursued my master's mainly because I wanted to have a better understanding of stats. Uh, when I was at Genentech, we were putting together validation packages for the FDA and saying, making templated statements about why something was statistically significant or not. And in my undergrad curriculum, I never actually took any stats, uh, which I regret now. So I encourage you to do so. Um, but started taking part-time classes and then applied into the part-time master's program and got a really cool understanding of uh, computer science and the application towards biomedical informatics. Uh, not really in the intent to go into that field, uh, but maybe as product manager in a future company have the context of how to communicate to those that are working in that field. Um, so it definitely gave me more of a technical perspective um, with the intent to use it for communication rather than application. I have some life hacks related to uh, big companies related to getting deciding to get your master's. So I didn't do my master's until I'd been working for three years. And it is a great way to have an excuse to go to another company if that's something that you want to explore or another field or something like that, because most big companies will hire you with a non-compete that's two years. So if you, for example, you know, found your dream role, but it's a competitor to another company, I mean, that's heartbreaking. So on one hand, you can use your master's degree, even if it's like a year and a half, you know, to strengthen that ability to pivot um, is one thing to think about. I also would recommend that you look at kind of the focus of your master's program. So like my master's program was very entrepreneurship oriented, which doesn't necessarily mean that I got like a pay bump or something when I got my new role, but it does mean that I have a better understanding you know, if I were to apply to a startup or something like that, um, I think Allison agreed that that was really, really helpful to have, you know, that as part of the, the mix in her degree. 
So, you know, make sure you're thinking really carefully about what kind of program. Um, and I also have to say, I probably had, I, I worked on three research labs when I was doing my master's and that's like a year and a half. So it's kind of crazy, but I actually made like a lot of progress. I, you know, I published papers and stuff. Um, but I don't think I've had as much fun working on technology. Like undergrad just didn't really give me the bandwidth balance to be able to work on the research that I wanted to do and also like get good grades, like the way I wanted to get good grades. Um, it might've just been my luck with which labs I picked, but it is a really fun thing to go back to after you've worked in industry and you kind of don't have the same pressure on yourself as you might have when you're an undergrad. Um, to go back and get a master's if you choose to do it that way instead of directly after. Um, as far as like pay bumps, you usually will like come in as, so instead of an associate level, you'll come in as like normal, like a senior, or not, not senior, but like um, the step above associate uh, if you get your master's. So that's just kind of a big company standard, but it's not a given. I mean, like Allison was saying, it depends on what you're being hired to do. Uh, and what you want to do, but I definitely can say that um, plenty of people get bachelors, decide not to get masters, or decide to get like you know business masters or something like that. And as long as you perform well in your company, um, you can still level. There might be a cap eventually, but you'll do okay. You can always go back. And some companies will pay help pay for some of that education as well. I was able to get ten thousand dollars a year reimbursement from Genentech, and I spaced it out quite a bit, so I really didn't pay very much at all for my master's, which I thought was a good benefit. Awesome point. Muted, but just also for science and engineering PhDs, you also don't pay, you get paid to go to school. I, I, I just want to make sure everyone understands that as well. <laughs> which is awesome. You get paid to go to school. Like, let's just like sit in that for a minute. So if you like school and you like research, it's, it's a great option. Yeah, thanks everyone for your thorough answers on that. It's so good to hear from people in the industry, you know, when it's necessary, when it isn't. And yeah, generally it depends, like everyone's saying. So I'll put my a link to career counseling appointments in the chat here. Feel free to schedule with me or another counselor, and then we can really dig into what is your future goal, and then does grad school make sense for that? Cool. Sarah, um, you had your hand up. Did you still have a question? Um, yeah, I was wondering what it takes to stand out um, in biotech if you only have a bachelor's degree, um, because I guess I'm approaching it more from the computer science angle where I don't want to do bench stuff, but I'm still seeing that I need a master's degree to work at most of these companies, and I'm not quite sure how to stand out if I can work for a random company um, in computer science for a few years to kind of like have a stronger application or if there's um, some other direction to take. Can I ask for a favor? Um, what companies are, have you seen often uh, requiring a master's just so that for context for us? I mostly see PhD requirements, but I apply to a lot of machine learning positions because that's what my bachelor's focus on data science and machine learning. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, so from the from the data science perspective, um, if you have the opportunity to do an internship, it is very, very helpful to show that you've worked in a corporate environment and able to have some body of work that you can potentially talk about and talk about your day to day of like how you get, got things done, how you self organized um, and how you communicated your results. I think those are really big things hiring somebody as a fresh grad. Um, and as we consider our our data science team and we're building it out at the moment. Um, we, we are looking at the moment because we're a very small company um, for four PhD level scientists who have established work. And because we're looking for them to be very research driven foundational understanding about a breakthrough in the field that we can hopefully build onto. Um, so I think it really depends on the size of the company. But if you have the opportunity to work on a portfolio or have some experience that you can share during that application phase, um, it can definitely help you put a, a foot forward. I would say you did the exact right thing showing up tonight. I think like there's more power in your network than you know. So I, I don't want to speak to the other panelists, but I can speak for myself and say like, reach out to me. We all have huge networks and like 
for, for me, I, I like to hire like the person. Uh, and I think you can be super intelligent and super confident with a bachelor. So if you demonstrate to them that that's me and you're referred to me by someone that I trust, then that, 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 that those credentials kind of fade away in my mind. I just want to talk to you and get to know you and understand how you think. So I think keep showing up to events like these, reach out to the people that are on the panel. Sorry guys, offering, offering you up. Um, and, and hopefully they can connect you to, to people that put, to put you in the right place. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, your network is super important. Um, if you ever have interview, like interview questions, how to stand out, I mean, I can give you advice on big companies, usually have applicant tracking systems, which is really annoying because then you don't actually get to know the real person. Like Allison was saying, if you have somebody that you know at a company, you just send them your resume, you know, I'm, I'm looking, you could even cold email sometimes, well, like cold LinkedIn often usually works if they went to Cal um, then they're more likely to respond and you can say, Hey, I thought your company was really cool. And it was really nice to see, you know, like maybe they posted something recently. Um, I hope you don't mind if I send you my resume, you know, I've been having trouble finding, you know, a role that's like matching my level. Um, or is it even reasonable to apply to something that requires a master's, you know, as somebody with just a bachelor's and they'll usually say, yeah, you know, I'd love to hire somebody who's taking initiative and probably has a great personality. I'm assuming. You seem great. So that's um, some advice that I would give you. Use your network and don't be afraid to just send your resume directly to somebody, even if it's a super tenuous, maybe you did like the same high school is a little bit tenuous, but um, you know, it could be just like, you know, you are big fans of the same volleyball team. Like, you know, it can be all sorts of stuff. Thanks everyone. And yeah, if, if you are comfortable panelists um, providing your contact info in the chat, that would be great, but no pressure. I get that you are all super busy. <laughs> um, so whatever you're up for. And then I'm gonna uh, jump to the chat question here. Um, someone's asking about how to make ourselves stand out during internship applications. Um, so if anyone has any general advice uh, for how to stand out, uh, feel free to jump in. I'm so excited to hear Allison's answer because she's been a hiring manager before. Um, but uh, I can <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Uh, I do. I get you though. Um, but I would say, you know, stuff that I've tried in the past is like really, you know, like elaborate resumes that are like really pretty, but then the tracking system has a lot of trouble digesting that and you might get skipped over. Um, I would say generally, if your resume is formatted a little bit different and you send it to a human, it's more memorable. Um, so I think that's kind of fun. I'm kind of curious if that's what Allison thinks about. Sorry, I keep talking about you, but I'm curious. No, no, I think that's that I, so I'm a little bit like OCD. So for me, like the, cl the cleanliness of the resume is super important. Like if I see any sloppiness, I'm like, if th this is their best foot forward, right? How is that going to translate into their works? So that's like an immediate red flag for me. I'm like, if they can't even do the resume yep. correctly, like, how is that? What is yes. the work going to look like? So that's like an automatic, like, no go. Depending on the person, sometimes I like a picture. It like makes it more personable. Like I've gone back and forth on that. Um, I'm like, oh man, this is a real human. Like, let me give it, let me give it another look. Um, don't take that as, as bold. It, I've gone back sure. and forth. Um, but I think cleanliness is super important and um, palatability, not too many words. Yeah. I won't read the words. I'm going to read like the heading. And then if I'm interested in the heading, then I'll proceed to read. The rest of the line so um if it's like soup like don't like brief is better because if you've done important things those things are going to speak for themselves and um so palatable and brief uh yeah. and clean which i think yeah uh, I, I think everyone would agree with that that's bad i think you all know this but i think it, it holds for me personally yeah if you're reading like hundreds of resumes or even if you have like indeed or someone that's giving you applicants it's just exhausting um, the other thing that worked for me and multiple people that I've interviewed with have commented on it is I have a website where I showcase my projects in a more visual manner because I'm kind of like, I kind of get lost in words sometimes. It makes me really tired after a while. So I have like a 
pictographic sort of representation of all my projects and then they're kind of set separated into different categories i think i could do a better job of making it easy to understand what the project is um, but people just like to click through and get to know what kind of person you are most of my projects aren't work projects they're actually like oh i went to the makerspace and you know made this really cool robot that does this really cool thing um and that gives people more texture because really otherwise you're a piece of paper i mean um, you don't want that. And user network. I also reiterate using network is a, it's a big way that we <laughs> source in, interns. Um, one of my um, old classmates from my time at Cal reached out to me uh, probably, I guess, five months ago now. Um, hadn't talked to her in probably three to five years. And she's like, hey, I've got this person I'm mentoring. Um, they're finishing up their masters. They look really interesting about your company. Would you mind connecting with them? It's like, sure, happy to talk to them, have to talk to them more about what we're doing and, and what they're interested in. And connected after that conversation, connected them to our hardware group because they were interested in, in mechatronics and they had worked for us and did a great job. So leveraging the network that you have is, is, is very important. And um, coming to events like these and being able to extend your network in any way possible can help you get further than you might expect. Also, if you ask somebody that's like kind of in your network, but like a little bit loose, you will stand out if you follow through. It is, there's nothing more frustrating when somebody like messages you. I mean, I can understand that school gets in the way. I'm not judging anybody, but um, all I want is you to be successful. So if you message somebody, please be ready to follow through and kind of put the effort in because it stands out to us and then we cannot help but root for you. So you will stand out definitely if you like actually follow through, you know, you say if you're applying to a job, actually send us what job within our company you're applying to um, with requisition numbers, things like that. Or here's my letter of intent. Could you help me edit it? You know, it's already you've done half the work and it means a lot to us. Oh, and we look at your LinkedIn too. So just as important as the resume, uh, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like the next step. If we like the resume, we look at the LinkedIn. So if that's like garbage, then that's that. It's tragic, uh, but that should also be obvious, I would hope, yeah. Yeah, so I have a, a follow-up question to that one. Um, and this would be for Allison, or feel free to also chime in, Pai and Masaki, if you have some in insight. Um, I'm wondering, with the applications that you review as a hiring manager, have you had any like candidates with experience or projects that really stood out to you um, that like maybe set them apart from other candidates? Yeah, I'm actually really curious to get Pi's take on this because right, we're a really early stage company. So I think we're more looking for culture fit and curiosity than we are a specific skill set. So we have so many op like areas of innovation that we need people to kind of fill in that puzzle piece that like, if you're a talented and intelligent and motivated person and you have a deep scientific background, we can find a place for you to innovate within our company. I think that's very different from a large, a large company where there's a very specific skill set that needs to be filled. Um, so for us, when we look to hire people, I think it's super underrated, but the first thing we're looking for is like nice people because you have that one toxic person and just like ruins the team. So I think like kindness and like ego or like absolute non, like we cannot do that. And I think um, curiosity is huge. So you have to be intellectually curious. And if you have that and you're a nice person, like there is some place for you within a startup that like, especially one like ours, molecular diagnostics, where there's so many different pieces of the puzzle. There's biology, there's nanotechnology, there's hardware development, there's software. So it's just such a multifaceted scientific field that we're operating in that like, um, we're not really generally looking for specific sets of skills. We're looking for demonstrated curiosity in one area of research generally. That was a really good answer. Um, yeah, I have some, even though I haven't really had to review um, a lot of resumes as a hiring manager, I would say um, I had a colleague who had started a robotics company in India 
and he did really well. You know, he got a lot of offers. But I think the thing that's important about following your passion, and you don't even necessarily need to monetize it, but being able to show that, um, you know, you can have a goal, you have a vision for making the world a better place, and you can kind of execute on smaller milestones, we'll be pretty translatable to any company. People usually find that pretty compelling. Um, I also have, you know, <laughs> people who are like, you know, oh, yeah, I went to the Olympics. And you're just like, what? Who are you? You know, um, but it stands out because it is a testament to your dedication. Um, sometimes, you know, it's easy to see like the perfect GPA and you really don't get a sense of the personality unless somebody puts on their resume, you know, um, like so for for me, I'm like a second Don black belt in Taekwondo, which I think is interesting. You know, I mean, am I biased? Sure. Or like, um, you know, I'm technically a professional dancer. Uh, in it, classical Indian dancing and those kinds of things. I mean, they take a lot of really hard work and you put the effort in, right? So anytime I see something that's like, you know, super into mountain biking, you know, usually you're not into mountain biking if you're like not determined and have perseverance. So that's, that's kind of my feedback on that. Um, I would say generally, if you have any student projects or anything like that, even if it doesn't, you know, turn into a, um, like a volunteer project in another country or something like that. As long as you are clear about what milestones and the role that you played in it, and um, especially if you can say, you know, we started this initiative and we improved the efficiency by 50%, any, any verbiage like that, I think is super helpful and stands out. Um, because sometimes it's like, okay, but what did you actually do? And why do I care? Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot um, it's more about how you kind of tell your story, right? And how you show your impacts and your accomplishments or maybe the things that are unique about you. So students, um, feel free to keep asking your questions, whether verbally or in the chat. I think, you know, we've, for the last 10 minutes or so, um, we'll probably be able to get to a couple more. But I'm thinking maybe we could talk a little bit about interviewing. Uh, does anyone have any, I guess, quick tips on that, whether it's addressing technical questions in an interview or behavioral questions? I think for me, I like when, like, I know it's brilliant. Interviews are really nerve wracking, but I just want to get to know the person. So to me, it doesn't have to be a super formal interaction. I want to see you relaxed. I want to see you happy. Um, sure, in like the technical, you know, we do like a dry lab where we ask like a series of really like deep technical questions. Yeah, take that seriously and take it seriously. But in, I, I want it to feel like a conversation and I don't want to feel like I'm hiring someone that is going to feel nervous around me all the time. So I would say do your best to like bring your confidence to the table and talk to me like another human being, which is exactly what I am. Uh, we're not the almighty source of authority. We are human beings as well. So I think just like bringing your confidence to the table, right? Not ego, but just confidence and knowing like we are imperfect. The interviewers, we don't know what we're doing. We're probably hiring you because we don't know how to do it. So like just know that. And I think that um, you don't have to, you know, be a professional and all that, but relax, take a deep breath. And, you know, as I said, we want to get to know you. Uh, and that's going to be more telling than like rigid robotic answers. It's also interesting to hear. Um, I don't remember if it was, sorry, Allison, probably who said this, but um, one of, at, at, at Culture, we have like a set of key values that we always ask about during behavioral interviews. Um, and we ask questions directed towards that because we wanna make sure that people are kind, curious and empathetic. Those are like kind of the, the core root of our company's um, perspectives and that we want to build a company that has an outlook to making a better future, both impact on climate and enabling the industry to grow, but also to do it in a place where people feel comfortable and wanna to come to work. And it's not like uh, nose to the grindstone um, ego is clashing and hard to actually uh, survive your day to day. Uh, so coming into an interview and being able to ideally show your authentic self and show that you're curious and that you've done a little bit of the research to know how to carry a conversation about the topic that the company is working in. And if they see if they have blog posts and 
some like shocking things that I've, I've realized that I like, attune myself to during interviews. And it, I realize it's kind of narcissistic, but like when people go to culture's website and see my blog post of that from like my hiring interview where they, they wrote a little background about me and they're like, oh, well, I saw you worked at NASA. Can you tell me more about that? And it's like, it seems like you've you thought through like, what is the, the purpose of the company and why are the people working there? You want to get to know if you fit there at, as, a, as a candidate at the company as well. It's a bit of a two-way street uh, and being able to show that, that maturity, I think is very important. Um, so I have a couple of pieces of advice that have always worked for me, um, and my interaction style. One is, uh, totally what Masaki said, like, do your research. I mean, people are so flattered, but also it, it makes a better conversation even for you because then you can kind of get into the depth of what is it like to work at that company? So I did a interview before this role where I walked in and I said, go bears. Cause both of my interviewers had gone to Cal for their undergrad, you know? And it's just like knowing that you already set up the interview for like positivity, right? They're like, Oh, how did you know you looked at the background? I mean, I'm kind of appalled that some people don't do that. Um, but LinkedIn is available for you partially for that reason. You know, there's always something interesting. Like one of them like did uh, Kelly dancing and was like, ran Kelly dancing at their school, which is like an Irish dance type, and he is not Irish. So it's just like a really funny um, way to break the ice. And then the other thing that worked for me, but that's because my ego is kind of small, it's probably smaller than it should be, um, is I had a professor that's, that said, uh, if you walk into a job, like you are already have the job, then often people will respond well because then it's easier for them to imagine so for my role at the um, biotech incubator in New York, I went in and I was like, these are the types of events I think we should do next. Here's my experience. And this is how I would execute that event. And I think it really helps them see like, okay, you can start tomorrow. Like you've already done the onboarding partially. Um, same for another job that I interviewed for. The role is kind of like doing some design work. And uh, I like did the design from based off of like, media and other things that I'd seen on the internet. And it makes it so that you can show your value as a strategic thinker sometimes, or you could just learn something really interesting and new. That's why I do it, because I'm actually a really curious person. Um, it's probably unhealthy. But I don't think that, you know, coming in, having done the work already would be very nice if you're just kind of like already a super confident person. I just like to be prepared so that I can be the confident person to bring myself, my real self, to an interview. Thanks everyone. Yeah, that authenticity can make all the difference, right? Um, even if you don't have like the exact qualifications, just showing them your personality can, can get you there. Um, so let's see if we can tackle two of these questions here in the chat. If we're interested in biomechanics, do we have to look for a job in biotech companies or robotic ones? Any advice on that? I think you could look in both. It depends on what you want to do. So that's, that's I think you have full autonomy to decide what interests you most and apply to that position. Um, I think a lot of orthopedic surgical startups would really benefit if you're looking into biomechanics. I know it's a little bit different from robotics. Um, and then there's a lot of academic startups that are, I mean, it, the whole point is you need some folks who have the bio background and some people who have the robotics background. Otherwise, what's the point of a team? We're stronger together. So yeah, apply. Awesome. Thanks. And then the next question is, what advice would you give to yourself in undergrad? Thinking back. Oh, it would def, sorry, I was waiting because I'm chatty. Um, it would definitely be like not to put so much pressure on myself. You know, when you're interested, you get the grades that you want, but more important, the rest of your, more importantly, the rest of your life is built off of what you're interested in, especially now. I mean, it's not great, but you work more and you work more because you're passionate and you will burn out if you don't really care about the work you're doing. So I would definitely say, you know, 
be more curious and give yourself a break. You're awesome. <laughs> you know, little kids. I don't know. That's not necessarily advice to myself, but maybe advice to you all is explore um, while you're in your undergrad, because you might think that you have this perspective that you're going to, in five years, do X, Y, and Z. Um, but then you go take a decal and realize that you have a passion about something completely different and realize that there's a job opportunity to do something that you never really expected existed. Um, and you have this really cool opportunity to meet so many people um, while you're in your undergrad, um, whether that's through sports, through clubs, through other extracurricular activities, um, they will help shape your network for the rest of your life. For, so um, take advantage of that opportunity. I realize many of you are coming from a year where you were all in school digitally, and I, I can't even imagine what that is like. Um, but I'm hoping that as, as classes start to be more available in person, you're able to take advantage of that opportunity to, to both meet people and experience um, and explore new crazy things while in undergrad, even like going to lectures and taking um, various graduate level lectures that are like one credit in my junior and senior year. It's something that I really enjoyed exploring other topics that I had no understanding or knowledge about but could listen to the grad students talk about their research and there's usually food um, and kind of get a benefit like, oh, if I wanted to go into nanotech, there's a 300 level or 400 level class. It's a nanotech lecture and it's literally just the grad students giving updates about what they're doing. And they usually take it as the advantage to get their free food. But if you're there as well, you can engage with people and, and learn more and be curious. Yeah. I. I agree completely. Uh, I think if I'm trying to, I'm trying to flick back on myself as an undergrad and I'd probably be like, that's awesome. But like, I don't have time, like good talk. Um, so I guess with that in mind, I would say like, for me, I was not a super, my GPA in undergrad was not great. Like I was like just hitting like the barely hitting the average of the bell curve. Um, I think engineering, we all know, is very, very challenging. And you're hitting the average of the bell curve in a, in a room full of highly intelligent people. And for me, like my major skill set, like I'm fine in engineering, but I don't think it's it's there. It's also like communication, which like the classes don't measure, um, or like thinking creatively, which generally like when you're doing a problem set, like that isn't valued. So I think like no matter what your GPA is, that is not all you have to offer, and that's not going to define your career by any means. Um, I think. You can be a great engineer and you can fail at your career. You can be a great engineer and you can have an amazing career and you can be a mediocre engineer and have an amazing career or be a, a terrible career. So I just think like, don't worry too much about the grades. If you're if you're on the bottom side of the bell curve, you're gonna be fine too. Uh, you went to a great undergrad institution. It's gonna work out. So don't worry about it and try to take the other panelists advice and take a deep breath and try to create the time to do some other stuff as well. I have a quick follow up. Uh, go to office hours. Work smarter, not harder. Do it. It's worth it, guaranteed. Yes. Get to know your grad students. They're there to to help teach, and they want to have the experience and opportunity to provide insight. And they're there to help you. Uh, I had a three point oh four final GPA, and it was hard for me to. I didn't. I didn't actually have any internships in my undergrad, and I had the opportunity, thankfully, to continue doing research, but uh, that was scary. And um it'll be okay awesome thank you so much everyone so we are at a little after six now um so let's wrap it up for the evening but i just want to acknowledge kwan i did see your um, comment about barriers as an international student so i would just encourage you to use that link for career counseling appointments to meet with our international career counselor um, she's an expert in the area and can definitely support you with your question. Um, yeah, thank you again, everyone. And thank you so much, panelists, um, for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Have a good night. I can send you my contact information to email out because I didn't put it in the chat. Oh, that's great. great. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I can send it um, to the students who checked in today. Yeah. Thanks for joining, guys. Thank you. A lot. Good luck, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.